In this video, we're going to talk about the generate tools, and we're going to focus on the first row of icons, and these are traditionally known as primitives in most 3D applications. And I think a lot of people skip over primitives because they want to build custom geometry. And I want to show you these tools because they actually offer quite a bit of customizability within each one of these so-called primitives. I'm also going to draw some distinctions between starting with these closed shapes that we did in the last video to generate some of these kinds of geometries compared to these primitives. Let's start off with the cube tool. You'll notice right away in the tool options that there are three different styles of cubes that you can start with. You can use the preset option, you can use the diagonal option, or you could use the axial option. I'm gonna start off with the diagonal option because it's pretty straightforward. You click an initial corner point and you click a second corner point and then you get to determine the height. And you'll notice that we have some on-screen controls here to control the parametrics of the object, which could also be controlled numerically. So if I just click on these graphically, the origin of these controls is in the center of the object versus the bottom plane. And that's one of the first distinctions that I want to make here is that when we drew using the rectangle tool set to the 3D extrusion object type, I click to define those first two corner points and then I click on a height and you'll notice here that the object controls are centered on that initial rectangle footprint of the object, not the centroid of the object like this one. So what I'm going to do here is select both of these, right click and say show controls and we can see that they are in fact different. And I just want to quickly show you what those differences are. The object that's defined by the initial rectangle, we can squish that down from the top and the base stays in place. Same thing for the one generated with the cube tool. If I click on the top, the base stays in place and I can go down. The difference is with the cube, I can actually click on the base and pull it up as well. We don't have that control because we started with the rectangle. Otherwise, they operate very similarly with width and depth. Same goes for both of those objects. A couple of more options here when it comes to generating cubes, which is to generate by preset. And preset is just that. You actually have to preset the width, depth, and height. And so I'm going to type in some basic numbers here, like 10 feet by 10 feet by 30 feet. And then a single click defines that cube on the reference plane. So it's just like it sounds here. It is a preset cube. This is great when you know the exact dimensions of the object that you want to create. For example, if I wanted to create a series of mullions for a window frame, I might say the width is 2 inches and the depth is 4 inches and the height is 10 feet. And now I can quickly create additional window frame mullions very quickly by just clicking on the reference plane where I want those to go. The last option in the cube tool is the axial option, and this allows us to define an initial axis. And so you can either follow the orthographic or cardinal directions of the XY grid first, or you can go off at any angle you want and you can click. And the second axis is defined perpendicular to that first one. And so that allows you to quickly generate a rotated cube. Same thing goes in the rectangle tool with the closed shape here. And again, set to 3D extrusion, you determine that initial axis, that secondary axis, and then the height. So those work exactly the same, but again, they are going to have slightly different controls when it comes to the object's base parametric controls. The second tool in the generate palette is the cone tool. And this is where things get a little bit more complex in a good way. We're going to, again, generate a basic cone here in this quadrant of our reference plane. And just like you would expect, generating from the center outward to get that first radius and then the height, because over here, again, in the tool options, I'm using the radius option. And again, those numbers could be dialed in numerically, or they can be dialed in graphically by just drawing it out. You'll see that there are other options to generate our cones. And one of the cool ones up here is an elliptical cone. So I'm going to click on that option and I'm going to generate based on the center point and then the initial axis and then the secondary axis and then the height. And so that gives us the ability to generate, you guessed it, elliptical shaped cones, which you probably wouldn't see as an option just clicking on the cone tool to begin with. Let's look at some of the controls now for these objects. So I'm going to right click and turn on controls for both of these objects. And I'm going to 
click on the end angle and you can see we can start to peel this object back and create a cone that actually has a side of it kind of sliced off and that goes for both of these over here if I do that on the elliptical one as well and so that could be useful if you wanted to slice the side of a cone off through that top point down to the base at an angle now some of the other controls you'll notice here are pretty typical where we could adjust the height and the width of the base. But if we open the inspector palette and take a look at the parameters tab, you'll notice that this is the type of closure that has been chosen where this is a solid object with the side sliced off. You can actually easily make that a surface object where it gets rid of the base and all of the insides of that cone and just gives us an outer surface. The final option here for the closure is more of a pie shaped object. And if we click on one of the start angles, we can see how that behavior interacts with that object. The other option with cones that may not be apparent is that you can click on this checkbox to truncate them, and the top can be a percentage of the base. So meaning the diameter of the top or the radius of the top can be a percentage of the diameter or the radius of the base. So I'm going to go ahead and type in 25%. We can see now that the top of it is truncated at a ratio to the base. And so if I pull this down, that ratio doesn't change because the diameter doesn't change. But if I click and change the diameter, you'll see the top and the bottom change at the same time because of that ratio. You can change that number numerically. There's no graphical control for that parameter. We can see with the cone tool, there are quite a few more options than were available with the cube. And that is going to continue with the additional tools in the generate palette. Our next tool is the cylinder tool. So again, I'm going to click to define a center point, a radius, and then a height. And using the close shapes tool, we could do something very similar with the circle tool. And again, set to 3D extrusion. And I set a center point, a radius, and a height. And again, these controls look a little bit different. I'm going to select both of these and show controls from the inspector palette. And we can see that, again, these are a little bit different. We have a radius control here on the one that was drawn with the closed shape. We have a height control, and we can open this up and peel it back. And you'll notice as soon as we peel this back, it turns into a surface, where on this object over here, we have a radius control we have a height control. And as soon as we peel this one back, you'll notice that this one now has these closure options just like we did with the cone. So if we wanted a surface, we can set that as a surface. We can go with a solid look where it slices off a side, or we can go with a solid look where it's slicing out a piece of the pie. And again, we have start and end controls for that. And we have dimensions for our overall shape. Next in our generate tool palette is the sphere option. So I'm going to again click to define a center point and then define the radius. Now this object is the first one to depart away from being able to generate this with the shapes. There's no way to generate a sphere from a closed shape. There are other ways to generate spheres in Form Z, but we're going to get into those in later videos using the revolve tool, for example. So what I'm going to do is draw a couple of additional spheres that are similar in size just so we can look at the different options all at the same time. So with these three spheres, I'm going to drag a crossing window over them and click show controls. And you'll notice that it bundles controls for start and end angle wherever we clicked to determine the radius of the sphere. Now with each one of these, I want to show you the different way the sphere tool works here. So on this first one, you'll notice the closure type. I'm going to go ahead and set that to become a surface. And you don't see a change on the outside of a sphere, but as soon as we peel it back, you'll see that there actually is a hollow sphere with this one. Whereas if I click on this, leaving it with the solid enclosure type, and you'll see that it is solid on the inside. And if I change my display type here to show the shadows, it's a little bit easier to see. And I'm gonna go back down to this one and peel this open. And you can see the shadow is interacting in there. So that truly is a completely hollow object with a shell that has no thickness. With this last one, I'm gonna click on this one and change the closure type to this third option, which allows us to then peel back the top and it leaves kind of a divot down in the middle of the sphere. So again, it's solid, but it's cutting a inverted cone shape out of the top of the sphere. And let's see how that interacts with these other ones a little bit differently. So with this closure type, it's capping it off at the top. And with this one here, 
If I click that down, you'll see that it maintains its surface settings the entire way down. That works on the top of each one of these, and it also works on the bottom. So again, we can get pretty creative geometry and complex geometry just by changing these primitive objects closure settings. And lastly, one of the things that I like about these tools with the start and end angle, if you peel a start or end angle back past its initial starting point, it actually just gives you that very small piece of that object. And so that's just a, a behavior to be aware of because you never have to guess. You can just go ahead and drag those handles and it gives you exactly what you're going for without having to stop and redo that object. The next tool in the Generate palette is the Torus tool, and I'm going to use the Radius type of Torus tool and just generate one large Torus here by clicking a center point to define that center origin. The next click defines what FormZ calls the major radius of a Torus, and a third click defines the minor radius of a torus. So we're basically determining the cross-section radius of the donut itself. And you'll notice up here in the tool options that we have three different numerical inputs for those different dimensions. And there is actually a minor radius X and a minor radius Z. And because that check mark was checked before we started drawing, I can't modify it right now, but I can after the fact, you can actually create an elliptical cross-section. So again, some of the more hidden options behind the complexity of a seemingly simple torus are very useful. So let's look at some of those options. Let's peel this open and get kind of a three-quarter donut shape. And let's go ahead and modify the Z radius of this only. So I'm going to uncheck the lock box here and let's go with 10 feet instead. And you can see how now that grew in height, but it didn't grow in width. Let's modify that a little bit more extremely and go with 20 feet. And we can start to get some very complex shapes. Now, if I click on that, because they're unlocked, I can actually graphically change those two things independently of one another. Now, some of the other options, again, looking at the closure types, is I can go to a surface type of an object where it is completely hollow throughout. And we can also click to peel back the outer surface of that torus in both directions. So depending on what kind of geometry you're after, maybe you wanted a curving roof type structure, or maybe you wanted more of a trough type structure, you can create that very easily with these different closure types. And again, numerically as well as graphically. There is a third type of closure. So we started with the solid, and that gives us a solid one. Then we went to surface. The third type actually allows us to create a very interesting peel back. So for example, maybe this is a park bench or something where you wanted the back of the seat to be more vertical and the bottom of the seat maybe to angle up just a slight bit and create kind of a fun piece of geometry. You can see it's solid, but it's peeling it back to the center point of the major radius of the torus. So lots of really interesting options when it comes to the Taurus tool. Again, kind of hidden beneath the surface of an otherwise generic primitive object. Lastly, we're going to look at the spherical tool. And you might be thinking, why is there a spherical tool and a sphere tool? And I'm going to show you why right now. Again, just to click to start generating and immediately you can tell that this is a different type of object. And this tool in the tool options has several different types of spheres. So geodesic sphere, revolved sphere, which segments the sides around the revolution. And you can see here that the resolution can be set where we can raise that resolution up to different numbers depending on what you need. And you can make that as high resolution or as low resolution as you would like. Other types are soccer balls with panels made out of both five and six sided polygons. I'm just going to go through the other options in this palette visually so you can see what the different options are here as well. So again, you can see that there's quite a few options hiding underneath that basic spherical object type. It's worth going through all of these options to really see the power that's hidden underneath the spherical object type and play with it quite a bit to get lots of different options for your basic primitive geometries as great starting points for your projects. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to get notified when new videos are released on this channel, click the subscribe button below and click the notification bell icon to get a notification when new videos are released. See you in the next one.